Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is our uh, first live stream of, a, of one of our lectures, uh, public lectures, since uh, things have closed down back in early March and we weren't able to do our, our spring lectures. And uh, we're really excited to be able to do this uh, tonight with you. And I know uh, we have hopefully a, a good audience out there and many people who typically come to our lectures. Uh, I am happy if you're watching and hello, it's been a long time and at least we can do it this way. Uh, this is a bit of a different system uh, than we're used to. Uh, so I, I believe you can uh, type questions into the chat bar on YouTube and I'll be able to see them and, and I can even share them with our guest speaker and we'll hold to do that until the end of the lecture. Uh, so just keep that in mind if, if anything pops up and um, you have a question, you can type it and then we can address it later. So that way you don't have to worry about forgetting it. And uh, other than that, I think it should be smooth sailing. I know there is a, a bit of a delay from what I'm presenting right now to what actually is appearing online. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and begin our lecture um, and introduce our, our guest speaker, Valerie Hall. Um, but before that, I have some words from Dr. Miller, uh, who uh, wanted me to relay this message to everybody, and uh, I think it's very fitting uh, about how this program has been working, because uh, for four years, the Society of the Ark and Dove, uh, made up of descendants of, of those first voyagers to Maryland, partnered with Historic St. Mary's City to create the Ark and Dove Scholar Program. Its purpose is to encourage scholarship about 17th century Maryland by providing graduate students or scholars early in their careers with funding, housing, and direct access to the extensive St. Mary City collections, research files, and staff. The third Ark and Dove Scholar is tonight's speaker, Valerie Hall, is a PhD student at the University of Maryland whose dissertation work is focused upon the remains of animals in late prehistoric and colonial Maryland. As you will hear, Valerie is identifying the bones found on varied sites, including the Leonard Calvert House at St. Mary's City, and applying exciting new methods of scientific analysis to animal teeth to explore their changing diet and human-animal relationships over time. Historic St. Mary's City is pleased to present Valerie Hall as our first speaker for the Fall 2020 Speaker Series. And again, I want to make sure to thank the Society of the Ark and Dove for, for providing funds for, for Valerie to do her research and many of the previous Ark and Dove scholars. I have always learned a lot from them. Many of the staff have always learned a lot from them because a lot of the research does tie directly to what we're doing here and it provides us a valuable resource. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Valerie up on here and she will be taking over in just a few bit of time. So, Valerie, good evening. Good evening. And uh, I look forward to learning more about animal husbandry and its practices in the 17th century. And thank you for taking the time on this evening to uh, share your research with us um, here at St. Mary City and all of our public. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the lovely introduction. And I also want to thank the Ark and Dove Society for helping to fund this project and making it possible for me to do this research. It's really fascinating. Um, as Peter mentioned, I am a PhD student at the University of Maryland with a specialty in zooarchaeology, which is the study of animal remains on archeological sites. And as I'll talk about a little bit more in the presentation tonight, this study helps us to understand better not only what people were eating in these time periods, but also how they were relating to animals and to the environment around them and how people and animals were impacting the environment and changing it. So I'm really interested in these relationships and that's what I'll be talking a little bit more about tonight. First though, I want to acknowledge that we recognize the land that as an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territories we reside on and as a way of honoring the indigenous people who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. It's important to understand the longstanding history that's brought us to reside on this land and its 
important for us to seek to understand our place in this history as well. We meet today within the traditional homelands of the ancestors of modern Piscataway groups. We acknowledge the painful history of theft and forced re removal from this region, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples that are still connected to the land on which we gather tonight. And despite centuries of oppression, the Piscataway people still have a very vibrant and dynamic tradition and meet regularly to date and pass on cultural traditions. But as I mentioned, to better understand our place in the modern uh, day, we need to look deep at the past and into the creation of this landscape. Understanding the changes that were happening in the colonial period isn't really possible without first looking at how this really unique landscape that we live in developed around the Bay Region and how it changed over time due both to natural forces and also to cultural forces, to the people who lived here. So the area was first colonized by the ancestors of the modern Piscataway and other indigenous groups around 15,000 years ago. And it looked very, very different at that time period. As you can see in the image on the left-hand part of the screen, and I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor or not, hopefully you can, because I'll be using it to point some stuff out. But um, as you can see, there were th there was a, an ancestral river valley for the Susquehanna River that first carved a channel through this landscape. And over time, that channel shifted and uh, entered the Atlantic Ocean further and further south while depositing lots of sediments, which through wave and wind action built up what we know as the Delmarva Peninsula today. But at the time of original human occupation, when they first came to this region, the landscape was very different because the sea coast was much farther out. It was still part of the last ice age. So it wasn't until about 10,000 years ago that the bay actually began to fill. And as I mentioned, by that time period, people had been here for a long, long time, thousands of years, and had successfully learned to manage this landscape and live on it and use the resources available to them. It's fascinating to think about this time because the landscape at that time period was so very different than it looks today. Oh, and I'm getting a message from Peter that I'm not on full screen, which I think may just be because I have two screens up right now. So Peter, let me know if that fixed the problem. Let me try again to go to full screen here and see if that makes a difference. Hopefully this will work. So um, thank goodness for text and all of the technologies that we have these days to be able to communicate. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here and be able to, to be a part of this, but technology sometimes presents its own problems. Excellent. It sounds like things are full screen now and everybody can see what I'm seeing, which is perfect. Um, what we know is that at this time period, the region that we know as Maryland today looked far more like the tundra that now exists in Siberia and the far north. And it wasn't just that the landscape and the plant colonies were different. The animal population was very different, too. And one of the major differences would it, was that it included lots of megafauna. So things like mammoths, mastodon, and giant ground sloth. And we know that people were using these animals at the time because we can find cut marks made by butchery processes on animals like the giant ground sloth, which obviously through this picture, you can see it stood twice as high as a human. So that, that was quite an intimidating <laughs> Um, capture once you went after and were hunting this species, but I'm sure that hide as well could provide lots of, of warm material to curl up in on the tundra. During the Archaic period, which started about 10,000 years ago, we start to see um, the Atlantic infilling what we know now as the bay and shallow estuaries were developing. Shellfish were becoming more abundant. And we see lots of shell middens from this time period because people were exploiting these resources. 
And then we move into the woodland period, which is what the archeologists call the, the period that immediately predates European settlement in our region. So we find evidence of permanent settlements at this time. We find evidence of, of pottery creation. Technologies were different. We see evidence of the development of the bow and arrow, among other things. And what's really important is that the evidence of the introduction of horticulture and cultivation of plants, both that were native to this area, like goosefoot, which is a relative of quinoa, and also things like what we know of as the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, as you can see in this image. And this is crucial, and I want you to remember this for later, because corn especially was not a native plant to our region. It's a, a plant that was developed in the subtropical region of Mesoamerica. And because it grew there in lots of different sunlight, where the sun's at a different angle than where we're at, it learned to fix carbon in a different way than our native plants do. And this is a big gloss of a very complicated scientific process, but it takes carbon out of the air and fixes it within its systems differently than our native plants do. So corn or maize as it was called, is a C4 plant that developed in the Mesoamerican region, whereas a lot of our native plants are C3. And in the stable isotope analysis that I'm going to talk about later, this becomes very important. So just kind of keep that in mind as we move on through the show. So along with domesticated plants, we see domesticated dogs or evidence of domesticated dogs within indigenous groups in North America. But in our region, that's the only evidence that we have of uh, the population domesticating species. However, most European species that we think of as like domesticated livestock today were domesticated between about 10,000 and 6,000 years ago. And this was a hugely important development in human history. It's a hotly contested subject among zooarchaeologists and other researchers who study this. But the simple answer to why in North America we only had domesticated dogs but in other areas of the earth, we were able to see different types of species domesticated. Seems to be that certain species are more prone to domestication. Um, usually it needs to be a species that has a very specific hierarchy in terms of their herd structure, um, with the assumption being that humans essentially take the place of the herd leaders. So goats, sheep, cows, all herd species that were able to be domesticated more easily than things like white-tailed deer here in the Americas. Um, and certainly in South America, the indigenous population had some domesticates as well. Uh, llamas, guinea pigs, some of those animals. Um, but in our region, to the best of our knowledge, it was only domesticated dogs. And this is fascinating too, because the auroch, which is the ancestor to our modern cattle, was not particularly friendly. <laughs> it was quite an ornery animal. So who initially got the idea to try to coax one over to eat out of their hand? I don't know, but you must have been a brave soul. Um, and it's interesting to see this process, too, because there are certain markers of domestication that we see in animal skeletons, but that's also very evident with whatever the genetic traits are that are linked to animals being more tolerant of humans and maybe more docile. And it seems that some of those genetic linkages are evident in coat patterns. So aurochs at, you know, in, in the early time periods would have had a solid coat color. The males would have had a darker coat with a lighter stripe down the back where the females and juveniles would have had a more reddish roan colored coat, kind of like you see in Jersey cattle today. But through the process of domestication, whatever those genetic traits are that make species more prone to domestication also are evident in traits that we can observe like spotted coats. 
Um, poor Bessie over here is never going to be able to hide from a predator with her black and white spots the way some of her ancestors might have been able to. And it's interesting to note, too, that the last auroch died out in the 17th century. It was something like 1627. So, you know, that's that's pretty amazing, too, because it you think of this giant primeval cow and and here it, it was in existence until around the time that Europeans were settling in our region. So European exploration of the Bay began in the 16th century and certainly trade with the indigenous population was happening at that time as well. And we know from some of the documentary records that a lot of those trades goods involved animal products, both um, the meat from animals for food and also things like skins and hides and furs that were taken back to Europe. And I also want to note, even though it's not within the scope of this research, that at this time period, Europeans were also bringing with them enslaved Africans to this region. And that's an important aspect of looking at human animal re relationships as well, because every culture has its own worldview and its own cosmology and how it relates to the natural world and how it relates to animals as part of that natural world. So certainly that African cosmology, the different groups of Africans that were coming, probably bringing different cosmologies, all had different worldviews and different ways that they were interrelating both with the people around them and with the animals and environment around them. And that's certainly important too because of the contributions that they made to diet and to culture in the region as well. So European settlers brought this package of domesticates to the new world that included pigs, cows, sheep, goats, and chickens. So all, all animals that we would think of as barnyard animals today. What can zooarchaeology tell us about what happened when these animals were imported and tell us about this region in the past? That's what I'm most interested in. So archaeofaunal remains, animal remains that are found on sites uh, where humans lived in the past, can tell researchers about the kinds of wild and domestic animals that they were using for food or for skins or for other trade goods, um, for things like dice potentially how they manage their livestock, and how these animals might have impacted the surrounding landscape. And I just had to put this picture of the sheep's head in here because we find a lot of sheep's head remains at St. Mary's City. And who looked this smiling fish in the face with his like super eerily human teeth and decided that he would make a great meal? I don't know, but it is the oddest looking fish I think I've ever seen. So domesticated livestock at this time period served as sustenance, as food, a food supply, as economic capital where your livestock herds were counted as part of your estate and valued as part of your wealth and as agents of landscape change. It's interesting to me, I, I love language too, and I find it fascinating that the word cattle derives from the same root as chattel which is basically movable goods, movable wealth. So cattle on the hoof are basically wealth that you have that you can move from place to place on like property or um, architecture. And you can see in these images that animals do have a huge impact on the landscape around them. In the two pictures with fences, you can see that on one side of the fence, you have more native communities of plants, but on the other side of the fence where animals have been grazing, those plant communities have been deeply changed by the, the grazing, the overbrowsing, the, the burrowing and trampling of different plant species. And you can see in the picture with the pigs as well that they have a tendency to root and disrupt root structures for the plants and uh, grasses as well as um, leaving droppings in the area and the, the nitrogen from urine can burn plants in an, a not recoverable way as well. So animals have a huge impact on the landscape. And we know from zooarchaeological research in Iceland that human managers of landscapes are aware of these impacts and we're taking steps to address them. And I think 
using the Norse as um, a, a precursor to European colonists in the Americas is really interesting because of course, these people were bringing domesticates to the British Isles from Europe in a colonization wave, and then moving on to places like Iceland and Greenland, and using the same Latinum mix is what they call it, this package of domesticated species, and using the same colonization techniques that they would then bring to the Americas in the 16th and 17th century. But in Iceland, what we see is that they were paying close attention to the impact that animals were having on the landscape. Before colonization, Iceland had a landscape that looked a lot like this, um, the picture on the far left, with the exception of the path, of course. Um, but it was wooded sparsely, some brushy plants and grasses. And then in the picture with the gentleman standing in the center, you see that that landscape has been incredibly changed that most of the, the plant communities have been just wiped off the surface and you pretty much have topsoil and a rocky surface below. Um, and that's because of overgrazing and rooting and some of the combinations of impacts that animals were having between the 9th and the 10th century in Iceland. And noticing this, it seems that the Icelandic colonists, the Norse colonists in Iceland, killed off their pigs in the mid 10th century. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but in the middle of this graph, you can see a strong red bar in the middle of the 10th century, pretty close to where the, the legend says Caprine in yellow, just above that. And that suggests that looking at the landscape and seeing the impacts that pigs were having on the landscape, the Icelandic colonists decided to cull most of the herd. So we find this huge deposit at that time period where lots of animals were killed off. And then as you can see in the bars to the right of that space towards where the arrow is pointing down, the, the pig remains are sharply decreased from what you see on the left side of that bar. So it seems like in an effort to mitigate the landscape impact that was happening at that time period, they culled most of the pigs on the island and maybe just kept a few instead of having the large flocks roaming around um, like they had had earlier. So what are the implications for the Middle Atlantic region? One of the studies that I looked at initially when I was starting this research was done by researchers named Arbuckle and Bowen, and it took place in 2004. They reported on it in 2004. And they noticed that taking biometric measurements where they measured certain aspects of cattle bones, sometimes like the ends of the bones or the width of the shaft of the bone, they noticed that there was a strong increase in size until about 1700, from the early years of the colonies until about 1700. And then they saw it steeply drop off after 1700. They suggested that this was potentially due to a change in livestock management strategies. And I found this really intriguing. Um, their research had taken place in Virginia. All of their samples were from Virginia but I wanted to look and see if we could see a correlation in Maryland as well. So we know from documentary research that cattle were allowed to free roam at this time, and that's actually what wild, neat cattle means. The wild part means that they were free roaming, but the neat part means that they were domesticated cattle. So this is farmers letting their cattle roam while they were probably off tending to their tobacco fields because that was the more profitable aspect of their agricultural practice. What we see from documentary records from the Maryland General Assembly is that landowners in 1640 and then again in 1661 were directed not to fence up their cattle, but to fence up their crops, their corn and other ground against cattle and horses, which are apt to go in and destroy said corn, and that they had a minimum height requirement for the field because it goes on to say, not in the, the part that I've exerted here, that if you don't build your fence high enough, then you're responsible for your own losses and we're not going to, to take any action because 
you should have built your fence properly and not let the cows get in to begin with. So we know that there was this group of free roaming cattle at this time period and probably other livestock as well. Free rattle ca roaming cattle and horses, definitely, but pigs were probably also managed in this way. So I wondered if um, Arbuckle and Bowen's hypothesis that the cattle size increased until about 1700 because the cattle were free roaming and because they were able to eat a lot of diverse plants and forage with the native plants in the region and that's why their size increased held true and then they supposed that after 1700 when cattle were enclosed in fences and were being foddered on byproducts from corn plants that that's when their size started to decrease so i took their same divisions and I collected measurement for cattle elements from the first four time periods. Unfortunately, I didn't have a sample from the 1775 to 1800 time period. But as you can see on the chart on the left, what that shows is the bottom line is the minimum measurements, the top line is the maximum, and the orange line is the mean. And then the chart on the right shows the mean with some error bars. And my error bars are very large because there's a lot of uncertainty in this sample, unfortunately, because it's a much smaller sample than the one that they originally were working with. So here's my results superimposed with Arbuckle and Bowen's results. Arbuckle and Bowen's are in the red line and mine are the blue line, the mean for mine. And you can see that the error bars to some extent overlap, which is a good sign because it means the populations do share some similarities. But you can see that in my measurements, I didn't pick up the same sort of increase up until 1700 that the original researchers did. And again, I think that might be in part due to the fact that my sample size was 92 and theirs was over 17,000. So I have a much, much smaller sample. And so some of my future research will be to continue to look at this question and explore it using some samples from other sites in the region. It will be interesting to look at as well, because as I noted, Arbuckle and Bowen were looking at cattle from Virginia and from sites from Virginia, whereas mine were all from Maryland. And of course, Maryland was established a good 30 some, 20 some years after Virginia was established. So. Virginia, their colony was up and running at the time that ours was just getting started. So that might have impacted cattle size as well. So one of the other lines of investigation that I wanted to use to look at this question about whether the cattle were free roaming or foraging after 1700 included stable isotope analysis. And again, I'm going to try to simplify and kind of gloss a very complicated chemical process. But basically, when an organism eats other organic material, it breaks it down into the atoms, the atomic parts of the element, uh, in a process called fractionation. And then these atoms become part of the bone as the bone is remodeled and as the organism grows. So with stable isotope analysis, we're able to break down those individual elements and see what the ratios are of one element to another. In this case, I was particularly interested in carbon, like I'd mentioned before, but also nitrogen and oxygen. So in order to investigate this, I took samples from cattle teeth, like you can see on the right hand side of the screen, and I took a chunk that included both the enamel, the hard surface of the tooth, and also the dentine, which is the inner surface and part of the root. And in order to process them for stable isotope analysis, they go through different processes. One, to demineralize the bone and keep the collagen, which is the soft spongy part of the bone. And for the enamel, it's to take out the organic material and leave that mineral aspect of the enamel. After the samples are processed and broken down, they're put into a mass spectrometer. Now, again, this is a simplification of a very complicated scientific process, but essentially this machine uses very strong magnets to separate out the elemental concentrations based on their atomic weight. So I was looking specifically at delta carbon 13, delta nitrogen 15. 
And the mass spectrometer broke these out. And then those elements are received in receptacles that then give the reading at the final stage. So what I found is that for the cattle in the earlier period, the 1640 through about 1700 period, I have a good cluster in the lower part of the graph here. This indicates that these animals were eating more C3 plants, the native plants that developed in this region. I have this one little transitional guy at about 1700, and then I have a cluster up here in the later period showing that the animals were eating more C4 plants, so likely corn. And again, this kind of supports the hypothesis that Arbuckle and Bowen first proposed that the in the earlier period, as animals were free roaming, they were eating more C3 plants, which are the native plants in the region, the woody brush and uh, grasses that we have here. Whereas after about 1700, the livestock management uh, strategies changed and the cattle were being enclosed and were being fed more of the, the corn and byproducts, the leaves and the stems from the corn plants. So this was a really promising result. And in the future, I, I hope to continue this research. As I mentioned before, I'd like to see a larger sample size once things are open and we're able to go out and collect data again um, for the biometric measurements. So measuring the cattle elements to see if I can uh, have a sample that kind of correlates with the rise and the fall of the Arbuckle and Bowen graph as well. I think it would also be really interesting to investigate um, woodland period deer samples. So that's prior to European settlement to see if we can determine a Delta C13 baseline for the region to create kind of an isotopic map or what researchers would call an isoscape of the region to show whether or not there are differences based on whether these animals are grazing on plants in the coastal region as opposed to the Piedmont and mountains and so on. And I also think it would be really interesting to look into sampling pig remains, which could be a proxy for human diet, since pigs were often fed on the human scraps that were left over from, from meals at the table as well. So finally, I would very much like to thank the ARC and the Dove Society for their Scholar in Residence Research Fellowship, which helped to fund this research, and also the UMD Graduate School Summer Research Fellowship, which funded my travel to Georgia, where I learned about stable isotopes and how to process these samples. Um, I also really wanna thank the staff of Historic St. Mary City for the access to the material and all of their support and guidance, as well as Rebecca Morehouse and the staff of the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory, who provided some of the cattle teeth samples from an 18th century site on their property. And Dr. Carla Hayden and the staff of the Center for the Applied Isotope Studies at UGA, which is where I did a lot of the processing and sampling of this material. And also my advisor, Dr. Paveo Zuckerman, and Dr. George Hambreck, who is a mentor and colleague in my department as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share my research with you. Thank you, Valerie. That was fascinating. <laughs> Being, um, I wasn't always the director of education. I was started my, my career here at the uh, Godiah Spray Tobacco Plantation and managing the livestock down there, the cows and the pigs. And so it's always, I always find it interesting when uh, we have the historic record, the documentary record of how people manage their livestock and then seeing your research and the archeology span behind it and how those two are meshing together to give us a more full story, a little bit more accurate story of, of how people managed um, and took care of their livestock at that time period. And, you know, I meant to mention it, but, um Jolly Boy and Little Bob, did I get their names right? We're at the, yeah. the top of the slideshow right at the beginning. I meant to point that out, that that's St. Mary's own neat cattle. Yes, there are two of our, our um, heritage breed, uh, Milking Red Devons, um, and along with our, our, our pigs too. So uh, right now, 
I don't know if anyone has any questions. I don't see any popping up right now. Um, I see one person says, thank you. Oh, that's, oh that's thank you for watching. Right here, Dr. Thank you. Um, what, my question is what, so I always wonder what gets people started on their research project? What led you to decide, I want to delve, delve into the archaeology of, of animal husbandry? <laughs> That's a great question because it's it's been a long and sometimes strange road. Um, I actually started out in education as an elementary school teacher and did some volunteer work in Maryland in uh, with the Archaeological Society of Maryland, which is a, a mostly avocational group that goes out and does uh, excavations and collects research and works closely with the Maryland Historic Trust and other organizations in the state and fell in love with archaeology and history. My mom was a history teacher, so I have to give credit where credit's due there. I'm sure I had an interest long before I started in archaeology. Um, so I actually got my master's degree at the Illinois State University, more in historic archaeology, although I did some Zoark work out there um, as part of my class course uh, schedule, and ended up working for a museum for a while in education and then as the curator before I found myself back in Maryland. Um, I did some work with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, which kind of put me on the path to zooarchaeology. It was something that I'd become interested in out in Illinois, but um, didn't focus my thesis on at that time for my master's degree. But it was something I really wanted to explore further. So that's why I decided to go back to school. And some of the work I had done with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center really sparked my interest in human animal relationships and how they relate to the environment and impact the environment. Because at the end of the day, even in the natural areas that we see, that's still a man-made landscape. It's still a human anthropogenic landscape. People have been in this region for thousands of years and were able to live and be sustainable in the region until European settlement. And that's when we start to see these really heavy impacts on the land. So that transition is very interesting to me. And, you know, looking at how that relationship has changed to both the landscape and to the animals that we work with and use, or today more often have as pets in our homes, um, is, is very, very interesting to me. And I think it kind of not only has implications for learning more about the past, but also has implications about how we can apply that information to the future and how we're stewarding this landscape. I mean, certainly there's a lot of conversation about blue crabs and oysters in the bay, rockfish and other species that have been impacted by overfished fishing and um, human impact like uh, runoff of nitrogens into the bay and things like that. So it's something that I think is very close to us today, even if we don't pause to think about it very often in terms of just the landscape that we see around us. So hopefully this research, like I said, will not only have um, implications for learning more about the past, but might also have implications for how we make decisions for the future too. That's a Awesome segue for our question. And you might have oh, right. kind of answered some of it, but I'm going to go ahead since this is, um, and, and, and to everybody, I, I also have to say and, and commend Valerie because she was brave to be our first test person on our um, um, live streaming. So we're both figuring these things out. And so there's a feature on this that I want to try out. So um, it allows us to share questions that people type in on the screen. And so here's the question. Can you, can you see that? Yeah. Can you relate your research to climate change? Again, I think all of, all of the decisions that we make today are historic ones if you think about them in terms of how they're going to impact the future. So I think 
you know, it's important to realize that the way we relate to these landscapes today is going to have those implications far into the future. And that ties into climate change in that we're already seeing its impacts in the Bay. Um, I think it's something like we're going to see 40 days of um, what they call sunny day flooding or nuisance flooding in Annapolis in the next 20 or 30 years as opposed to just the few days that we have today. So certainly all of the relationships that we have with the natural world and the animal world are context for the decisions that we make about how we steward our relationship to the planet and how we steward these resources. I think up until this point, our perspective has been more extractive where we're looking for how we can use the resources around us, but maybe that's not the best way to look at that relationship. And maybe we need to start thinking about different ways to approach the landscape, not so much for profit and for use, but ways that we can care for it. Excellent. And I, I thought that was a nice feature how it puts the question up there. Um, and, and what you're saying also just reminds me of uh, pigs. Um, me growing up originally in Texas, uh, there's a lot of wild pigs and, and the amount of damage that they do to the landscape, you know, uprooting plants, uprooting trees. And then when it rains, it causes lots of runoff that then goes into streams and, and causes damage further downstream as well um, with erosion and all that. So uh, I know there's some evidence of that here in Maryland, especially when it came to uh, plowing and techniques in the, in the 1800s. And I did that for a purpose because I like my nice segues, and I have a question here involving pigs as well from, uh, it was texted to me because they uh, couldn't get the chat to work, um, from Travis Parno, our director of research. Hi, Travis. Uh, what sorts of trends do you expect to see when you run similar tests on pig remains? Interesting. I think um, I didn't go very much into the nitrogen results that I have. Um, nitrogen is a really interesting element to look at because it's indicative of where an organism is in the trophic web, which is a complicated way to think about who eats who, essentially. So for animals that are herbivores that eat plants, they have a very low nitrogen reading, but animals that are omnivores or carnivores have a much higher trophic reading because an animal eats a plant and then is eaten by another animal that's potentially eaten by another animal. And each one of those steps increases the nitrogen reading. So I think with pigs, because I'm assuming what we would see is that they're being slopped with the remains of meals, which from my research I know includes a lot of sheep's head among other fish and things like that. So I think we'll see much higher nitrogen readings with pigs that might echo what we would see in um, human remains in terms of what humans are eating at the time period as well. And marine species and estuarian species like we would have here in the region have a much higher nitrogen reading than um, animals that are eating the plants straight like cows would be uh, because marine species eat plankton that's eating smaller plankton that's eating smaller plankton and it, you know you have many more of these steps before you get to the species that you're eating. Excellent. Uh, so this causes me to think you know the the study that you you were um, working with in Virginia where they had I think you said 14,000 samples or was it 1,400? 17,000. Yeah, over 17,000. 17, That's a lot. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it makes you think about our collection here at St. Mary City and some of the questions the public asks, like, why are you saving all these things? How many little bones do you get? Where do they get the bones? Um, so it makes me wonder, you, you have a sense of what our collection is like in the rest of Maryland, especially if you want to look at, at deer, how... What do you think the likelihood of other institutions being, um, holding on to those types of samples as opposed to just tossing them because they don't fit whatever immediate research they're digging for at that moment in time? I think 
if they're following best practices, um, then they're going to be holding onto those samples. And this is something I'm very passionate about as well, because the research that I did with my master's thesis and now my research that I'm doing with my dissertation is all on existing assemblages, existing collections. So for my master's thesis, I didn't go out and excavate any new sites. I used resources that were already here in Maryland and looked at existing collections to do that work. And that's what I'm planning to do with this as well, because a lot of times due to a variety of reasons, funding and time being, you know, two huge ones, researchers, archeologists who are doing the original excavations have time to look at the collection, do some analysis more often with other material re remains and not so much the zooarchaeological uh, assemblage because that requires some specialized knowledge and will list those things but not do a really deep dive into interpretation. So there are a lot of collections that have been looked at and maybe cataloged, sometimes not even that, that exist in repositories around the state. So it's really important that somebody go in and take a look at these collections that maybe haven't been looked at in 20 or 30 years since they were excavated and be able to put that information to good use. And the other key piece of the work that I'm doing that is maybe a little bit different than a standard excavation is that looking at one site gives you kind of a snapshot in time of what was happening on that site at that time period. But if you look at an entire region and look at not just a particular time period, but look over a couple hundred up to a couple thousand years, you begin to see patterns that aren't evident on just one particular site. Um, the research that I mentioned as part of the presentation in Iceland has been done in part by one of my professors and his colleagues, and that's the approach that they've taken where they've looked at a region over centuries, sometimes millennia, and using these different lines of investigation, whether it's um, ice cores to tell them about environmental conditions, paleobotany, which is looking at the plant remains left behind at archaeological sites, zooarchaeology, um, regular analysis of the material culture that you find, like the dishes and the clothing ornaments and things like that. Taking this broad temporal uh, range, this like long time period, and being able to look at it across a region instead of just a couple specific sites here or there gives you a much larger pattern about how people were reacting to things like environmental change over that time period. So I personally feel that it's really important to draw on those existing collections because not only should they be put to good use, but also they can give you a much bigger picture of what was happening over centuries or millennia. Thank you, Holly. I think you, you illustrate, a, 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 I think, a very important aspect of, of archaeology that I think sometimes a lot of people forget is, is most people think of archaeology in, in that um, more, uh, the very like adventure or sexy, like digging in the dirt and it's hot and it's summer and you, you're getting dirty and you're collecting and you find these things and you're screening it. And people always forget that, that that's the initial part. And a lot of the work is behind the scenes in the lab. Um, doing the scientific method and looking at um, scientific equipment to break down molecules to, to do the types of things that you are doing. And, and by storing these uh, artifacts uh, properly and ethically allows future archaeologists to um, have access to this data that our current archaeologists and archaeologists in the past might not have thought of, didn't have the tools to be able to even extract the information that, that maybe that you're trying to extract right now. Um, and so I think this is a really neat um, lesson I hope for the public to understand some of why we do what we do, not just in, in terms of like the stories that we tell, but how, what we collect and why we keep so much of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think Indiana Jones lied to a lot of us. <laughs> it doesn't really look like that. It's a lot more tedious at times, but as you noted, a lot of our best discoveries happen in the lab once we have the time to really clean up the material, take a look at it. And also, like you noted, a lot of the techniques that we're using today didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago for us to be able to find this information. So 
what I'm starting to see now is not just the move to excavate sites, but in some respects, there's also a movement to preserve sites because we don't know what we'll be able to, to figure out in the future as technology advances. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter site up in Pennsylvania, a little bit west of Pittsburgh, which is a site where they think humans have occupied this little overhang in the cliff for thousands of years, you know, 15, 20,000 years maybe, although that's a little debatable too, but they've actually preserved something like a third of the site that they haven't excavated. They haven't touched it at all, knowing that in the future, we have the potential for so much more extraction of knowledge and processing of the information that's there. So they've made the conscious choice instead of just taking all of that material out to look at it, they've chosen to preserve portions of that site for future research should the technology advance to that point. Of course, in terms of climate change, like the earlier question, we in this region also are dealing with the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. So sometimes we don't have the option to preserve the site. Sometimes we need to go in and excavate and, and take the information that we can find because in 10 years or 20 years, that site will be inundated. And especially in terms of bone preservation, when you have inundation of water tables and then the water tables sink and it climbs and then decreases, you, you see a lot of impacts to preservation. So some of these organic materials just don't preserve well in our very acidic soils to begin with. But then when you have this additional um, impact to the site, you have to sometimes make a really hard decision about trying to ex excavate that site and not protect it in place because leaving it will do more damage than excavating it will. And like um, cliffs along river streams or on the bay. That's another example, like Calvert Cliffs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, where uh, we're seeing the, the cliffs kind of crumble. And and sometimes we find really interesting sites that way. But unfortunately, we also lose very interesting sites that way and a lot of information, too. Well, Valerie, I don't see any more uh, questions. And you've, I think, asked answered all of mine. <laughs> so I feel like I had... At least for me, I feel like I had a nice personal history lesson, archaeology lesson, and a nice chat with you. Um, so I appreciate that. And uh, I, I wish you well in the future and your future endeavors and, and look forward to hearing more about your research. And uh, for everyone else out there, uh, we do hope to have uh, another lecture in October, the third Thursday of October. And uh, we'll be posting that uh, link a week before the lectures is how this this uh, system works. So um, I'll keep you all posted and uh, have a good evening and good night, Valerie. Good night. Thanks everybody for watching. <laughs>